in the 60s, I guess I'm intrigued as to when you first kind of came across this class of, of compounds, you know, the, the kind of image we have is that it was all about LSD. That was the thing that was kind of spoken about most, most widely. Um, so it, it kind of mm -hmm. came as a surprise to me to know that even there were pockets of people experimenting with things like DMT because it's such a different substance experientially. And, and it's it, perhaps because it's so extreme, it didn't make its way into the popular culture in the way LSD did. Um, do you remember the kind of the climate at the time was your first experience with LSD and were psilocybin mushrooms just not something that were used as widely? Well, my, my first experience was with LSD, you know, because that was what was around at the time. And I went, I went to Berkeley. My, my brother was living in Berkeley in 1967, in which was the summer of love, right? Supposedly okay. the height of the hippie movement. I, a friend of mine went out there that summer why my father let me go, I'll never know, you know, because he, he, he had to know that we were going to get into some weird places. But anyway, I went there and we, we took LSD for the first time there. And basically, uh, my friend and I, and we just, you know, well, you know, you, you could, we, we encountered this hippie on the street that was selling this stuff and their little as, tablets of aspirin with a tiny blue dot in the center of it. And they said, oh, yeah, this is great stuff, man, wonderful. You know, we thought, sure, man, okay. So we got this LSD and it, it turned out that it was very good LSD. So we had that experience. Uh, there was not a lot of DMT around. It was it was a rare thing, you know. Uh, it was more a rumor than anything else. But Terence was uh, very good at working the matrix, so he was able to find DMT, and uh, he had some friends, actually from high school, from the uh, uh, from his. Uh, he finished his last two years of high school in California. And some friends of, from his junior year had some connections at the Stanford Research Institute where they were actually researching DMT. So he was able to get it and uh, very impressed by it. I didn't take it myself until a year later. And, uh, but I was also very impressed. And that was really the basis of our obsession with these things. Right. He could he could figure it out. He, he could find it. And that, that's what set us off, you know, on this quest for DMT. Yeah. I mean, you, you, you've you slightly touched on it already in, in the way that it kind of produces a kind of a 100% reality replacement experientially. But it might be worth, if you don't mind, kind of to someone who has no idea of this terrain, explaining what it is that's so astounding about DMT. Because to me, it is just, it's in a league of its own not only amongst mind altering substances, but I would say amongst anything in the natural world. I, I don't think I've encountered anything as astounding as, as the DMT experience. Yeah, I, I, would, I would agree with that. Uh, you know, I often tell people in, in these talks that, you know, it wasn't only the most interesting drug that we had <laughs> encountered, it was the most interesting thing that we had <laughs> encountered, you know. Uh, and, and I'd say, you know, 50 years later, that's still true in some ways. The tryptamines are just fascinating. Yeah. And, uh, you know, coming at it from this idea, uh, you know, this subjective uh, uh, impression that it really is another place, you know. I mean, I understand that that's really a misunderstanding of what's going on, I think. I mean, it's another place in your mind, you know, but right. and who could say what dimension that is in. You're a neuroscientist, but it's, you know, you have the impression that this is really a different place. And, you know, the, the science fiction uh, uh, connection is also interesting because it seems like a very science fiction-y place. You see right. machines, you see entities, you see, you know, all of these things that are suggestive of future worlds and extra dimensional worlds. Now, now psilocybin uh, at that time, uh, you know, wasn't, it, 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 psilocybin didn't really come on the radar of the counterculture until, until we published this book in the mid seventies, you know, I mean, we, 
my brother and I can take some credit for that. Other people were working on it, but I think we were the we were the first to put it out in a form that uh, you know an right. easy method that any any you know fairly in, in focused nerd could figure out you know and grow them in their basement. Um, but in the '60s, psilocybin was a rule, a, a rumor, you know, and nobody knew where it was or how to how to get it. Uh, uh, you know, I remember my brother mentioning, you know, he was looking at the on the bulletin board uh, at the local co-op in Berkeley, and he ran across this note that says said psilocybin. Does anyone know where to get the magic silver dust? <laughs> Which I thought was kind of strange. So, so, uh, so psilocybin didn't really uh, get into the counterculture till the mid seventies. Except, of course, there were people, um, uh, you know, that were going to uh, Oaxaca and pursuing it that way. But we we didn't do that. Yeah, I feel like the other route as well was, I guess, you had Oaxaca and um, Maria Sabina, right, who introduced it to the West via uh, Gordon Wasson. But then my understanding is his spore supplies went to Albert Hoffman in Europe, where they synthesized it. And then places like yes. Harvard, Leary, they were working with psilocybin, but through this very kind of, right. I guess, formal pharmaceutical route, um, rather than, yeah, something where everyone was having access to kind of raw mushrooms. Um, yeah, I, I, I mean, people didn't have access to mushrooms, and you know, unless they were very quiet about it, or, or like I say, if they went, you know. But but over that decade, it became it sort of emerged that hey, the, there are two hundred different species of these mushrooms, and they're all over the world. And you know, if you know where to look, for example, in the Pacific Northwest, there are probably thirty species that grow in the uh, Pacific Northwest. Most of them would be hard to find, but a, but a few of them are quite abundant, you know, like they're in, found in common places like, uh, you know, uh, in parks and, and that sort of thing, because they grow readily in bark mulch, these wood growing fungi. So, uh, you know, Psilocybe cyanescens, which is much stronger than Cubensis, you know, is, is common. It's common here in Vancouver. In Vancouver and BC, you could go to UBC, look at the rose garden at the right time of year, and you'll find them in abundance, you know. Uh, so they're out there, you know. And uh, other ones like Psilocybe semilanceata, which likes grasslands, like pastures. But I, I, don't, I don't know if it's a dung growing fungus, but it does grow in pastures. It used to be you could go out by the airport in Vancouver and find them. And when I was a graduate student at UBC in the uh, like 1980 to 84, people were doing this, you know, they'd go out, there was nothing illegal about it. Uh, there were attempts made to, you know, I mean, people would get busted, but they get busted for, uh, for trespassing, you know, on, on farmers lands, not for picking mushrooms right. so <laughs> probably as it should be <laughs> rather yeah, than yeah. For picking mushrooms 